How many of you remember the Crandon Mine? No. That big thing. Right? <laughs> Technically, that was the Crandon Mining Company located in Crandon, Wisconsin. Who owned the Crandon Mining Company? Well, it was Exxon, and then it was another company, and then it was another company, <coughs> and then it was another company, and then finally the Native American tribes. Right? So it's really difficult to get a handle on where the money's flowing to because we don't really have a very good clear handle on the ownership structure. And if these companies are privately owned, they don't have to tell us anything because they're privately owned. Only if they're publicly traded do they have to report out this kind of information. Okay? So this is another big question. Where's the profits going? Some of these companies, when you go down the list and you look at them, you know Badger Mine. The company's been in Wisconsin for, what, 100 years? So there are some companies you can identify and go, I know that's a Wisconsin company. A lot of these other ones, I have no idea. If you got a question, please ask. Otherwise, I'll just keep rambling on. Okay? Now, how to do the economic impact assessment. The Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation estimates that the typical frac sand mine has about 10 jobs. That's not right. A little high. Okay. The typical processing facility or combined mine processing <coughs> facility has between 50 and 80 jobs. That's not a little high? Okay. I thought a little high too. <coughs> so what I did to do the economic impact and update the economic impacts is I basically said, oops, is let's say we've got 16 active mines. Okay? If we believe Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation that there's about 10 jobs per mine, and there's 16 jobs, or 16 mines, that's 160 mining jobs. There's 49 active mine and or processing plants. If the typical one has 50 jobs, let's take the low end of that 50, 80. That's about 2,500 jobs. Okay? Combine those, you got about 2,600 jobs in the sand mining industry. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that number to conduct my analysis on this. Okay. You just drop that many jobs into the sand mining industry. Okay. Now, the problem, that, <coughs> excuse me, the problem that I've got is that from our uh, one data source, there's 555 jobs, but from this source, this little way of doing it, how do those two line up? Where's truth? Well, I'm an economist. If truth hit me upside the head with a two by four, I wouldn't know. <laughs> right? In reality, this is some of the problems that we have when we do these kind of assessments, is that there's a lot of unknown. Okay? Now, why might this be like this? One is out-of-state companies. This is predominantly Wisconsin-based companies. We don't know where the out-of-state companies are reporting their numbers. They could be reporting out of Texas. So there could be a Texas company that employs 100 people, but they're actually being reported out of Texas. <clears throat> they're not supposed to do that, but they do. Okay? Is Wisconsin Economic Development overly optimistic? Yes. Have any of you been following the politics of <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say any more. Okay? Self-identified as another industry. This is a particular industry. This is uh, industrial sand mining. Could it be that these sand mining companies are actually identifying themselves as something else? Okay? How many of you have your own personal business, not a farm? Okay. When you fill out your income tax, your business tax returns every year, they have you identify what is your business, right? It's an industrial classification code, okay? My brother runs his own business. He does art conservation work. Um, he did, when they <coughs> took this, uh, the Abraham Lincoln home in Springfield Park, they took it apart, they put it in a big bowl. They took it apart board by board, right? The inventory. He got the job to do the conservation work on all the furniture. Right? 
I asked him, how do you classify yourself? He goes, oh, I got uh, whatever. <laughs> you're not, Craig, stop doing that, because you're making my dad a crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So it could be that, you know, these companies are simply identifying themselves as something else, okay? So what I'm thinking is that truth is probably somewhere in between those two extremes, okay? But for the point of discussion, I'm going to go with that number, okay? Because that makes it consistent with how I've done this in the past, okay? Now, this is the economic impact. If you want, if you want I can describe how I came about these, where these multipliers come from. But, um, spare you? Okay, I'll spare you. There's a couple of things here that I want you to look at. One is there's lots of different ways to measure the size of the economy. Employment, labor income, which is wages and salaries for prior income. Total income, which includes labor income plus dividends, interest, right, transfer payments. Any of you on Social Security payments? No, you're in there. Okay. <coughs> Industry sales, another way of measuring the economy. How many of you have heard that the agriculture is an $88 billion industry? Okay, they're using that number. Why? Because that number is always going to be the biggest number. Just from an accounting perspective, it's, it's going to be the bigger number. Okay, now what's the total impact here? The total impact is about 5,000 jobs, about $327 million in labor income, about $880 million in total income and about $1.3, $1.4 billion in industrial sales. There's the mines itself, which is the direct. The indirect is kind of the business to business transactions. Okay. Paying utility bills, paying for gasoline for the truck, or diesel for the trucks, things like that. And then there's this induced effect. That's labor spending wages from the local economy. Okay. And then the total is this, the sum of it. Now, what I want you to walk away with is the size of these multipliers. How many of you have heard, everybody knows that for every job in mining, there's an additional eight jobs generated elsewhere? Any of you heard that? What do you think? Yeah. There's a couple of things. I, I tend not to get on a soapbox. Um, but I'm on a mission for God. <laughs> <laughs> Beat down any multiplier that's bigger than two. Right? What this is essentially saying is that for every job in manufacturing, or let's say every ten jobs in manufacturing, there's about another nine, maybe ten jobs. For every hundred dollars paid in wages, there's another 62 cents or uh, $62, and so on, <coughs> okay? Whenever you have a developer come in to your town and say, if we build this, it will have a multiplier effect of 10. We're running out of town. Because they either don't know what they're talking about or they're trying to con you. How many of you remember the dog tracks? <laughs> How many communities went out and said, if we get a dog track in our community, we're going to generate all these jobs in terms of hotels and restaurants and retail. Why? Because the consultants that the state had hired had said that for every job at the dog track, there will be 10 jobs generated elsewhere in the economy. Communities went out and invested serious money based on that number. How many dog tracks do we have left? <laughs> Okay. Be leery of anybody that comes in with a big multiplier. Now, why do you think these multipliers are modest like this? It's what economists call leakage. How fast does this money leak out of the economy? Think about the frack sanding when it was at its peak. 40% was pure profit. Where's that 40% immediately going? It's leaving the area. It's a leakage. Okay, how many of you are farmers? Okay. What if you buy a $200,000 piece of equipment and you buy it at a local implement dealer? <coughs> How much of that $200,000 does that local implement dealership actually keep? How much of it goes back to the manufacturer? Maybe 10%. Okay. 
That's a pretty high mark. Maybe 5%. So that $200,000 that you just spent in the local economy, how much of it stays local and how much of it immediately leaves the community? Maybe $10,000 stays local. You see how this money, this is one of the things we want to try to do when we try to talk about economic development, is that we want to try to minimize these leakages. We want to try to keep more of that money in the local economy. Okay, so this is an economic development tool that we want to use. Okay? Now, this is likely optimistic. First of all, I'm using data from the uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, where he talks about that. And the second is that this hasn't caught up with what's actually happening in the market right now. This data's already dated. Okay? Now, what's happening now? How, well, I stopped, I went out, I, I started to collect headlines on what's happening to the industry. And I stopped after about 10 minutes because I had too many. Okay? Frack sand providers blasted by weak oil. Three reasons these frack sand, sand stocks could plunge even further. Now, this one's important. All the articles have tended to focus on communities. Okay? This one is actually talking about the industry, the companies. Okay? These are the, uh, the publicly traded companies. What this particular article is talking about is that these sand mining companies, as a point of view, as an investment, is probably a bad idea. Okay? Why? Because they're collapsing. The market is collapsing. Okay? Many of these companies did what in order to get up to speed really, really fast? They took out a lot of debt. Okay? How do you think they're going to be able to cover their debt if prices plummet? Okay? There's a real concern here that a lot of these frac sand mining companies, particularly the smaller ones, are not going to be able to write this thing out. They're going to go bankrupt. Right? Now, the question for you as a community is, what does that mean to the mines that they have operating? If they go bankrupt, who's left holding the, holding the bag? Okay? This is why um, uh, the licensing agreements, and I'm not sure about all the legal, the legal aspects of it, but having, uh, someone was talking about insurance before, having bonding in place to make sure that there is a pot of money there to help claim the <coughs> if the company goes bankrupt. Okay. Uh, another one, Energy Wire. This is an energy um, um, uh, focused publication. Mining towns worry frack sands will dry up and uh, oil prices plummet. Okay. Star Tribune, low oil prices, less drilling. Less drilling, less a need for frac sand. Capital Times, frac sand firms struggle with falling oil prices. Oil price, uh, um, oil price war catches uh, state frac sand in the crossfire. Frac sand slump. Uh, I think I got one more here before I. Okay, these are all probably ones that you've heard. Okay. So what is driving this boom bust? Oil prices. When oil was up around $100 a barrel, guess what? These frack mine operations, <laughs> these oil fracking operations, were very profitable. The tar sands out of Canada was profitable. What happens when the price of oil drops down below, I've heard, $60? Don't ask me where I got that number, it's just a number that sticks in my head. These operations are no longer profitable. If they're no longer profitable, what are they going to do? They're not going to operate. They're going to shut down. What does that do to the demand for frac sand? Okay. Boom. Who is driving this drop in oil prices? More specific than OPEC. The Saudis. The Saudis, the Saudis have decided they don't want Canadian tar sands to be competing against theirs. So what do they do? We'll crush our competition. Good. Okay. Look at the tweeters this morning. New one. 
Guess what's going to come online now because we've reached a, an agreement over their, their nuclear program? Iran. Iran oil is going to flood the market. What's going to happen to the price of oil? Down more. Down more. What's going to happen to frac sand? Down more. The bigger companies might be able to write this out. Okay? The smaller companies are not going to be able to write this out. So other fallouts from this. Okay? And I'm just going to share a few of them with you. Results for in for Buffalo and Trumpville County elections. Frack sand opponents won several victories in Trumpville County and Buffalo County elections last week. That's uh, May. And then I debated about this one. Anybody from Arcadia? <laughs> okay, I'm just going with what the story says here. Is that the mayor was recalled partially did not let the public have enough input on frack sand mining in the western Wisconsin community. Isn't that true? Woo! <laughs> back to my conclusions, I want to repeat on why I think this is important. Okay? Now, what I want to do now is to share with you some simple analysis that we did where we want to look at uh, the, the presence of uh, mining companies uh, related to various measures of economic well-being. And what we're doing is this simple kind of correlation analysis where we have one variable, which is how much mining is going on, uh, against <coughs> things like uh, income, unemployment, uh, health, things like that. But we want to find out if they're simply related to each other or not. Are they related in a positive way? Are they related in a negative way? Or do we have the dreaded ball of data, which means there's no relationship? Okay? So this is what I want to share with you. Okay? This map, you can see it better on this screen, what I'm looking at is gravel, sand, gravel, clay, ceramic, and refractory material mining and quarry. Look at all, this is all the counties, all the great counties have got one of these types of mines in the area. Okay? Now, you may say, well, wait a minute, all the frac sand mining is occurring up in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Why are all these other counties? From an economic perspective, do you think the economy really cares if you're digging up sand or digging up gravel? It doesn't the economy doesn't care. Okay? It's, the, it's the cost. It's the company spending money to do that mining and the employees spending their wages in the local economy. The economy could care less if it's sand or clay or gravel. Okay? So what I want to do then, okay, so now this is another way of looking at it. This is actually the number of firms, right, divided by 100,000 people, okay? The green is basically, well, the, the white is there's, there's no mine there. The green is, you know, one to five, there's not a whole lot there. That's your, that's your neighborhood uh, quarry. And then up to the dark blue is that you actually start to see some more. Now here you'll notice that this it's primarily frac sand, right in here. Okay. We get a little bit out here. We get some down in here. What's going on out here? Think about what I'm dividing through by. <laughs> ah, bingo, there's no people out there. Okay. So you can have three mines and only 100 people in the county. Okay. So don't worry about that. Okay. So this is the this is the data that I used in my correlation analysis. Okay. And what we got here is um, you want to look at a couple of things here. You know, is it a negative? Is it a positive relationship? That means they move together. Is it a negative relationship? That means they move in opposite directions. And is it statistically significant? That's what these stars here mean. Okay. If there's no stars, that means there's no relationship. Okay. So. What do we got? There's no impact on household income. 
there's evidence suggesting lower levels of child poverty. Lower unemployment rates. Lower levels of income inequality. Higher levels of education. Okay? So based on this, is mining necessarily bad for a community? Not necessarily. These tend to be good paying jobs. Okay? And what about quality of life factors? Lower teen birth rates, that might be a function of poverty, not the fact that there's a mine there. Lower violent crime rates, and that might be a function of poverty. Higher air quality, uh, I don't know about that one. Right? I think I'm really pushing the limits of what I can infer from this. Okay? Less housing stress. Less food insecurity, more water quality. Okay, so generally better things associated with mining, but not all necessarily positive. Okay, now what about health factors? Generally, higher levels of overall health. Why? I think it's because these are fairly good paying jobs. Okay. Higher child mortality rates. I don't know about that. Okay. The key here, though, is note the size of these coefficients. These are all really small. Okay. So, I don't want to draw too much from this in terms of saying, if there's a lot of mining, you're going to have these things. Okay. I don't want to say that. I can't say that. But what I can say is that mining isn't necessarily bad for the community. These are fairly good paying jobs. Okay. So what are the conclusions? Mines, particularly the types of mines such as sand mining, are not inherently bad for the local economy. There are some positive things attached to it. <coughs> mining is inherently unstable. Tom made a comment about this in his opening comments, and he made the comment, frack sanding is different. Tom you, didn't, Tom, you didn't say that, but your people have said that. <laughs> right? Do you think frack sand mining is any different? No, not. Okay? Whether you're digging up gravel, you're digging up clay, whatever you're digging up, you're still digging something up. Okay? It is inherently unstable. Okay. Um, there's a number of us in that have done a number of these workshops around the state, and this is something that we've been harping on, is that there's a gold rush mentality right now. It will probably bust, and you need to prepare for when it's going to bust. You know how much we want to stand up here and say we told you so? <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> By the way, I guess I just did. Okay. Now, the question is, Will this industry come back? No. Eventually it will. Because you think the price of oil will always stay as slow as it is right now. It will eventually go back up. Why? Because we will eventually run out of it. Okay? Now, when will it go back up? To the point that this kind of operation is probably <coughs> If I knew the answer to that, I would be on Wall Street driving a brand new Ferrari. <laughs> okay? I don't know. Saudi Arabia could change its policies tomorrow morning. Okay? We don't know. That's why we need to plan for this instability. It is finding consistent with the vision the community has for itself. <coughs> this is where comprehensive planning Zoning comes into place because as a community, when you have those kind of discussions, you're trying to make a decision about what do you really, what makes your community unique? What is it about your community that you want to fight to preserve? But yet at the same time, allow economic opportunities. Okay? And that's going to vary from place to place to place. One of the very first workshops I did on frac sand mining, there was a, an older gentleman, and it looked like he was going to burst out in tears. 
And he basically said, you know, he's the town board chair. And he said, we went through this comprehensive planning process a couple of years ago. And the community identified wilderness, wildlife, farming, quiet way of life. That's what we hold in value. That's what we want to protect. Okay? But then all of a sudden we've got all these sand mine opportunities popping up and people, you know, the decision make lots of money. What do I do? If I do this, half the time is going to be mad at me. If I do this, the other half of the time is going to be mad at me. A lot of conflict. Right? But having the community go through these kind of discussions can help offset those conflicts. Okay? The other thing is, is that um, Tom mentioned the work that I did in Buffalo County. There's a couple of folks from Buffalo County here. When we first started these discussions in Buffalo County, right, how do you think the room divided? Half the room was like over my dead body, and the other half of the room was like, this is my land, you can't tell me what I can and cannot do. Okay? Do you think that there was a bridge over time between those two sides of the room? No. Yeah, there was. Guess what it boiled down to? We want to try to promote tourism. Okay? We have this river road that goes down the Mississippi River, and we want to try to promote that as a weekend touristy type place so that we can bring people from the Twin Cities, you know, car clubs. Motorcycle clubs, not motorcycle games, motorcycle clubs, <laughs> right? And kind of ride, okay? But if we have all these sand mines in the area, they have to truck. What are they going to be trucking over? Those exact same roads. That's where the conflict all boiled down to. Okay? It boiled down to that simple issue. What do we want to try to promote? And are these two things compatible? These types of discussions are really important in the community. Okay? The community process for making the decisions about mining is more important than many realize. Those election turnovers, the turnover in the county courts in Trempeleau and um, Barron County, okay? that was as much over the lack of a process than it was anything else. So taking your time and having these community discussions is really important. Okay? And giving folks the chance to kind of have their say. But then you've got to make a decision. You've got to move the community forward. Okay? And I'll stop with that. So any questions? Well, it's not really a question, but you ask, is there a difference in the mining? And you know, I don't know a lot about mining, but I do know what went on in Preston County and Preston County yeah. because I live there. And the thing is, I wonder if there's a difference. And you know, how many town chairs go open gravel pits um, and are involved with, uh, you know, and ours, the town chair was uh, not protecting us, I feel, from sand mines, but he was soliciting his own sand mines. You don't ever get rid of that effect. And what about the cumulative effect that the city that is in the town of Brooklyn, the land that has just been contracted, has annexed three sand mines, which is thousands of acres of land. So is there a difference in mining? Well, how many gravel pits, how many people open gravel pits because of this, or annex land because of gravel pits or whatever? So there is a difference in the type of mining that's affected the community. And that community, I don't think, will ever be open. You, you, raise, you raise a couple of really good points. And I think that's partially the gold rush mentality. It was the quick buck. The quick buck. Right. Okay? And that's part of the American culture is quick bucks. Okay? How, look at Wall Street. Okay? Do we really care about how profitable this company is going to be five years from now? No. Did you make your quarterly numbers? Did you make your quarterly numbers? That's how our culture is set up. In terms of whether or not there is an ethical question with our elected officials, that's up to you as the voters. Okay. In terms of the economy, right, the economic impact, it doesn't matter if it's standard or crap. It doesn't matter. And so when I say that, I'm talking about it from a purely economic perspective. 
Is there any research that's been done about when you have an industrial um, industrial plant come into a rural area, what we use in other economic purposes uh, uh, it, it depends on the type of industry. Excuse me, the type of industry that it is. Um, if it's a, uh, a service-based plant, I mean, it's going to it's going to drive in one way. If it's a manufacturing firm, it's going to drive in the other way. But in general, uh, no, unless it's a noxious type industry. If it's a noxious type industry, then yes, it can have a negative impact. Uh, there was a, another set of studies that we did, and I didn't share it with you, that looked at the impact of mining on future economic growth. And we looked at employment, income, and population growth. And what we found is that they're generally associated with positive employment growth, positive income growth, that's the positive economic side of this, negative population growth. And the reason is because people want to live next to these things. They want to work at them because they're good paying jobs, but they don't want to live next to them. Now that opens up a whole other question of, is what's the impact on land values, okay? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty clear that if you own property right next to the mine, you're going to get hit. If you own property a quarter of a mile down the road, I don't know. I think what's going to be more important is how many times those trucks are going back. Okay? And there is no research on that. But I know. One more questions? Thank you for the research you've done. Um, I, I really, you're the only one I know of that's doing good research here. It really helps to inform the oh decision God. making. <laughs> okay, I will. Um, the, the question I have is, when you're talking about multipliers, you know, so that is a figure that is applied when the boom is happening. Um, in other words, you know, when frac sand mining is going on and it's profitable, it's creating 1.89. Once it's gone and it's oh. defunct, is it a one-to-one -one relationship? Is the inverse one-to-one? Or is it something very different? The way that I do this mathematically, you just put a negative sign in front of everything. In reality, it's different. Okay? And that's really kind of pushing the limits of our science in terms of a positive impact going this way, a negative impact going that way. We, that's a great question. I wish I had a really good answer. We're, we're going to have to, I apologize. This is uh, great. We have lots of interest, but we have, we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to have to call it. I'm going to have to call it. So let's give Steve a